Welcome to Basket Sprawl, my weekly foray into what's happening around the league. Just the NBA, you ask? Oh no, we'll be playing a suffocating full court defense on all kinds of different entertainment. So as we dip our pivot foots into the wonderful world of the National Basketball Association, we'll never be more than a Euro step away from topics such as movies, music, and popcorn. So I invite you to come count carries, take the underdog money line, and grab your headbands, headphones, and popcorn as I welcome you to episode one of Basket Sprawl. My name is Sam. I'll be the host of the show. Humbly, gratefully, honored to host this show. Share it with a couple of colleagues. You know them as TPJ and Pavi at Hoops and Brews. So go check it out. Get wise. They hold down the lane of talking about basketball. They dive deep into the analytics. They do all the dirty work when talking about basketball. Now, me personally, love the game, have my whole life. Not too deep into the analytics, though. So my show is pretty much my opinions. I feel intuition about certain things, and I go with them. Now, hopefully some of you vibe with them, and you might not. But that's what I'm going to give you. Hopefully you like them. Hopefully you hate them. But hopefully you feel a way about them. So let's begin. Structure of the show is going to be three parts. This first part is a season recap of this last season. Now, we're not going to get into all the drudgery of the regular season and the, uh, the crazy narratives that went on throughout the playoffs. We're just going to talk about the important stuff. All right, we're going to trim all the fat. So let's get right into it. Let's talk about the Warriors. Okay, Warriors, arguably a co-protagonist of the NBA last season. Everyone was pretty much resigned to the fact that the Warriors were uh, going to do it by the end of the season and take home the championship. I have quite a few friends that are very pessimistic about the league because they just think it's going to be Warriors, Warriors, Warriors for the next, you know, six, seven years. Now, I choose to enjoy the journey. So you're not going to hear a lot of KD is the worst person ever for joining the Warriors for me. The man joined Golden State. I'm going to try to joy, enjoy him because he is a joy to watch. So two finals MVPs back to back really stepped it up there in the finals versus the Cleveland Cavaliers. I want to specifically highlight his game three masterpiece, which in my opinion was probably the best game he's ever played. Uh, he just had an utter mastery on getting all his shots up. If you listen to him talk, his goal is to get shots from all types of angles. And I don't think I've ever seen it work better for Kevin Durant than in game three of the finals this year. Um, I affectionately refer to him as Perimeter Shaq as a kind of a joke between my friends who uh, enjoy basketball. And I think it's a pretty apt comparison. He's utterly unstoppable at getting perimeter shots. These bad games everyone was uh, saying he was having when he finished with 27, 29 points, the shots just weren't going in. I mean, you just can't, you can't hope to stop him. You just can't. And he really put it on in the finals. Stole a finals MVP from Steph and good on him. You know, even when he was trying to give Steph the MVP, he still finished game four with, what, 20 points, triple-double. Um, so yeah, Kevin Durant just dominating when he has to. Game three, unbelievable. Don't put that man to game three. Uh, impossible. So, let me transition to the man, Steph Curry, one of my favorite players in the NBA. Um, a lot of people tell me I remind them of Steph Curry. Uh, I, I have top seven, top eight jump shot in the state of California, I'm told. Um, known to go 90% from three when just shooting around. So, um, I admire Steph's game quite a, qu quite a lot, and I'm sure he'd admire mine. Anyway. He played well in the playoffs. I like to refer to this time in Steph Curry's career when we look back, probably referred to as KD era Steph. Um, you know, how is he gonna perform when uh, in the huge games? I mean, if you think back on it, these last two years with KD, they've had two big games, three, four maybe, the facing elimination versus Houston and game three of last year and game three of this year. It's the only four games that have been important for this team. and. Uh, people have kind of taken the spotlight from Steph in the, in, since they started winning championships. In 2015, Iguodala won the MVP uh, in the finals, and even though he scored about 26 points a game, he didn't play Steph basketball that we'd all expected. Uh, in 2016, he came back from an injury, and sure, he showed out versus Portland, has got the overtime record now with most points in, a, in an overtime period, but it just caught up to him. And, um, in the finals, 2016. So 
they lost that one. And then last year, Kevin Durant just kind of owned the platform. He just stepped up to the moment and played some of the best basketball, best basketball he's ever played. One finals MVP right from under him. Steph, I thought, played great. But I think it's pretty undeniable with this playoffs. You know, he had, in all the games the Warriors won, except for the one time he scored 11 points and he was held to just 11 by Cleveland, even though he was still pretty sensational in that game besides that, I think. Um, he really made an impact on each one of those wins. Statement, classic, this is what transformed the NBA type Curry performances you got in this playoffs. And it was really cool to see a KD era Steph just go all out. So, um, that brings me to the enigma himself, the one, the game six maestro, Clay Thompson. Now, there's something we need to understand as a people and a civilization about Clay Thompson. And it is that when it's game six, there is just nothing anyone that has ever lived in any alternative universe and in any existence that is gonna put this man away in a game six when his back is against the wall. I think he put up, 70, 75 points, 76, uh, 80, uh, 30. He put up a lot of points in game six and basically it was all over once Clay started getting going. Um, game six Clay, we will come to respect, we will come to love, we will come to cherish. Speaking of, it, it was, it was, it was Super Saiyan, it's Super Saiyan-esque. And if you wanna get really specific and you'll find, I will get very specific about my Super Saiyan references. Clay Thompson in game six is like future trunks appearing for the first time going Super Saiyan, the first time we see anyone other than Goku go Super Saiyan, and just peace up, Mecha Frieza. Clay's quick fire three in game sixes is like future Trunks' sword that he uses to slice up Frieza. So that's the comparison that I think of, and I have a lot of respect for future Trunks, as I do for Clay. Now, there'll be a segment on this show, it's called, What is Clay Thompson doing at this very moment? Um, and according to my sources, they're telling me now, yes, um, right now, Clay Thompson is in Budapest, actually. He's taking a chocolate milk thermal bath, getting ready for the off season. He's preparing correctly. My sources are, are, are very trustworthy. Um, when I think of Clay Thompson, I think of Rocco, his dog. I'll d word up, Rocco, that's his dog. So that's our dog as a, as a humanity. Um, chocolate milk, baffling, awesome, do your thing. Two-way superstar, all right, three-point god. And uh, he is about that green. And when I say green, I mean, you know, positivity and, and get that money, the green he's on. Good for you, Clay, do your thing. Now, I'm gonna transition out of the Warriors from this last season and talk about the other co-protagonist of the NBA. And that is Mr. King President LeBron James, okay? Just give you a little background, because I know everyone has their own story on how they interact with LeBron now. I used to hate LeBron. As a fervent Bulls fan growing up, he was at the end of my season too many times to count, and I was too young to appreciate what I was seeing, so I just hated LeBron for years. Um, that all changed when he rejoined Cleveland, I think. I think I started to really love the game more, and I started to really understand that I might never see anyone like this ever again. And um, I just started loving it, cherishing it. It's an event when LeBron plays. I, I'm, I'm so lucky to see this guy play every night. And what I have to say about him is nothing that hasn't been said already. He was amazing in the playoffs. And I know all these GOAT conversations are being had, but I'm not even gonna get into that. That's a whole nother discussion. Um, but. What I will say is that objectively, we all kind of just expect LeBron to give us 35, nine and nine, which is just absurd. It's just, and then he does it. It's not, that that's like his bare minimum. He had a broken hand allegedly and, and, and gave you 35, nine and nine, no problem. Um, so it's just astonishing. And uh, he's gone this season. He's going to be somewhere else very soon. And uh, I'm thankful to watch him, excited to follow him, see what happens next, see how he shapes the league now.